Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, I am Dr. William Hansard. I am the uh, outreach coordinator for the Theodore Roosevelt Center. Uh, what that means is that I do uh, presentations to groups that come in or do virtual presentations uh, about our collections. Uh, I also do all of our uh, social media and uh, blog posts and our, on our website, things like that. Get those things posted so that you know what's, what's going on with us. Um, and that being said, uh, it would be a miss if I did not make a little plug here. You may or may not have noticed on your name tags, that on the back side there is a QR code. Uh, if you have not visited our website or haven't spent too much time on it, I encourage you to scan that QR code to take you to TheodoreRooseveltCenter.org. Uh, spend some time in our digital library that has been mentioned so many times. Um, there's about 85, 90,000 primary sources available on that website, primary and secondary sources. Everything from letters and books like we've talked about to political cartoons like you see here. Uh, all kinds of great things available to you. So please uh, avail yourself of that resource. I don't think you will regret it. Um, that being said, that out of the way, uh, I am pleased to introduce to you this morning Dr. Julie Green. Um, Dr. Green is a professor of labor and immigration history at the University of Maryland College Park, and she is the author of The Canal Builders, Making America's Empire at the Panama Canal from Penguin Press in 2009. Uh, that book received the Organi Organization of American Historians James A. Rawley Prize for the best book on the history of race relations. And her fourth forthcoming book, Box 25, Archival Secrets and the World of Caribbean Workers, will be published by the University of North Carolina Press. Um, that book, The Canal Builders, is available for sale outside, uh, and it's a book I would encourage you all to read if you have not. Um, it's a book that I actually read fairly early on in my own graduate studies, and it had quite a bit of influence on, on my own scholarship. It was one of the first books that introduced me to what in the field we often call bottom-up, history from the bottom up. So instead of focusing directly on men like President Roosevelt, it's more about the people who were affected by policies that men like Roosevelt enacted. Um, and that was really, really fascinating to me, to be able to learn these stories of individuals on the ground, in this case, uh, who are responsible for the physical building and engineering of the Panama Canal. Uh, really fascinating work. Um, and so it was my great pleasure to be able to introduce to her, her to you today. And so I give you Dr. Julie Green. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, William. That's very nice. Um, and good morning, everybody. How are you all doing? It's so nice to be here, to be back in what I like to call the land of clay, as in <laughs> Clay Jenkinson. Um, I was last here about eight years ago giving a talk. I think at that point, that time, I talked mostly about the Panama Canal, and I got to know Clay and this beautiful region. Uh, but as Clay knows, I'm a neighbor of yours. I was born and raised in Nebraska. Not quite next door, but pretty close. Uh, I still, we still have a family farm there that's been in the family since about 1880, and so I'm really passionate about the Great Plains. I have moved east, have moved around, but I keep being pulled back to this wonderful part of the world. I'm really grateful to Chris O'Brien and Michael Cullinane for organizing this event and inviting me to join you. I'm happy to be making new friends, and henceforth I'll be seeing this as the land of Chris and the land of Michael, as well as Clay. So I want to talk a little bit today. This is really a bottom-up talk about the working class at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, it's not a talk about Theodore Roosevelt, although in my first book on labor and politics, I, I dealt with him quite a bit. Um, the kind of the traditional story of labor in this period and labor's struggle to achieve full rights um, went like this. Huge clashes in the late 19th century, early 20th century, making some middle class allies, but still ultimately at the federal level failing to win really basic <clears throat> fundamental rights 
um, <clears throat> workers, <clears throat> excuse me, workers built unions, they had radical organizations, um, they tried both workplace action and political mobilization, but ultimately they achieved few gains in this period at the federal level. No right to unionize, little right to strike, no freedom of speech at the workplace. Labor won one of its greatest goals, the Clayton Act, that exempted unions from antitrust legislation, but this didn't stand up in the courts. It won a child labor law in 1916, but this was declared unconstitutional. The Meat Inspection Act passed in 1906, resulting from Upton Sinclair's novel, The Jungle, but he wrote it to draw attention to the poor working conditions, and instead it focused on creating safe meat. He quipped, I aimed at the public's heart, and by accident I hit it in the stomach. So why was this? Why did labor fail um, to win more gains? I want to explore this with you a little bit today. The labor movement, dominated by skilled, white, native-born workers in this period, failed to represent all workers. Instead, they focused on excluding from jobs and unions any workers they deemed unworthy. Socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, and gender inequality in the U.S. and the ideas and strategies workers developed about their roles as producers was central to these dynamics. Uh, in some ways, some of what I want to probe is how it is that workers came to focus on this so much, and, and to some degree, I'll be echoing some of the themes in, in TJ's great keynote last night. These issues, in turn, led them to see it as their right, as valued members of the nation, as a way to, to um, <clears throat> protect their right as citizens to exclude workers they saw as less worthy. Consequently, they not only reflected inequalities that existed at the time, but furthered and strengthened the structures that caused those inequalities. And this is really important because it shaped the entire 20th century, generating tensions and divisions that would be very difficult to overcome. In the late 19th century, of course, there were massive battles as labor sought to win more rights. The 1877 railroad insurrection, the Haymarket incident and the first Red Scare, the Homestead strike, the Pullman boycott, yet in all of these spectacular clashes, workers faced defeat. Not until the 1930s, after some major structural and demographic and political changes, would workers win fundamental rights. The working class became more homogenous by the 1930s and thus less divided, and meanwhile the political crisis of the Great Depression creating an opening which labor militants exploited. There are, of course, many reasons why labor couldn't achieve more gains at the federal level. Political parties' indifference to workers' problems, a limited federal government, hostility of the courts, for example, but what I really want to focus on today is what was happening within the working class itself that helps us to explain this. In the late 19th century, facing all of these defeats, basically my argument is that the labor movement turned towards policing who would be allowed into the working class, who would be allowed to compete with white native-born workers for jobs. Why did workers turn to this strategy? I argue that to understand this, we need to look at deep ideas in American political culture. In particular, there were powerful ideas of who deserves to be a citizen, who deserves to be a member of the working class that had a deep history in North America. <clears throat> 
Inequality, of course, was widespread in 19th century United States, and working class people were part of this larger culture. Even within the working class, there were deep, deep sources of inequality. Enslavement and the Jim Crow that followed it meant that black workers remained a racial underclass. The labor, the labor movement matured amidst this struggle against slavery, leading to notions of the importance of thinking in terms of free versus slave labor. To be a worker, to be a valuable citizen, you must be free. You must not be a slave laborer. Women, of course, lacked voting rights and economic independence. Immigrants faced xenophobia and lacked voting rights until becoming citizens, which some were permanently barred from becoming. And of course, Native Americans were a colonized and subject people. To understand this, we really need to look carefully at how important these issues of economic independence were in the history of the United States. Even long before the United States became a nation, economic independence was hugely important. We could even link it to the very beginnings of settler colonialism on the continent with its emphasis on land acquisition and the dependence on forms of coerced labor. In the colonial <coughs> era, the, the majority of labor was uh, performed by people who were coerced workers in some way indentured servants or enslaved people. For today, I don't want to delve too deeply into those issues, settler colonialism and colonial labor relations, but it's important to note that this issue of owning some property, some land, economic independence, became really ingrained in American understandings of citizenship. So for today, let's a good starting point is the 1790 Naturalization Act. One of the first things the new Congress did was establish who could become a citizen. And the 1790 Naturalization Act specified that only, quote, free white persons, as you can see there, could become citizens. By free, they meant economically independent, owning some property. So from the very beginnings of the country, class as well as race was linked to citizenship. And citizenship thus became dependent not only on whiteness, but also on economic independence. Likewise, the ability to vote was linked historically to economic independence. Um, citizens who didn't own property couldn't vote in the early 19th century, only in 1856 is complete and universal male suffrage achieved. Women, of course, can't vote until the 19th Amendment, and African American men and women in much of the US lack the right until 1965. Core ideas of democracy were linked to economic independence as well. The US in the 19th century revolved around ideas of small r republicanism, linked very closely to the American Revolution. It involved a belief in democracy, but that democracy had to be founded in turn upon moral producers. And only the economically independent, the self-sufficient, qualified as moral producers. As Benjamin Franklin put it, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. So since democracy rested on this pillar of economically independent producers, permanent proletarianization, which is what industrial capitalism was bringing, could jeopardize democracy and the entire social order. All of these ideas profoundly shaped workers' thinking during this period of transformation as they confronted the rise of industrial capitalism and their own proletarianization. It shaped their critique of capitalism. <clears throat> 
and even as proletarianization made economic independence harder to achieve, workers held to these fundamental ideas. A true worker doesn't act like a slave, a true worker is virtuous, and a true worker refuses to work cheaply. These ideas shape notions of who deserved to be in the working class. If workers couldn't reform capitalism, which with all these defeats of the late 19th century, they felt they could not, <clears throat> if workers can't achieve full rights and equality, maybe they can defend their rights by excluding the unworthy, excluding those who are not moral producers. This cartoon from the period gives you a sense of some of the concepts. The, the workers are very much concerned about the new inequality being ushered in by industrial capitalism. They, they feel their position holding up the country and they're striving for ways to defend their rights as citizens. So all of these ideas profoundly shape the U.S. labor movement. In the late 19th century, as workers face repeated defeats, the AFL shifts from, I mean, it still works to reform capitalism in some ways, but the official labor movement increasingly focuses on policing who can join the working class. Samuel Gompers declares, cheap men are not wanted. He loved to quote Abraham Lincoln, we will have all slave labor or all free labor. Lincoln also said, wherever there is slave labor, there can be no human progress. This leads us to the anti-Chinese movement, hugely important for understanding working class politics in the 19th century. The anti-Chinese movement really became the first major signal that white male industrial workers were shifting to what I call this strategy of defending their rights by excluding others. Although strongest in the West, but a nationwide movement, it relied on really horrific physical violence uh, political mobilization and lobbying to fight for the exclusion of Chinese workers. Uh, these images you see are from, obviously from a poster, the, um, the design there showing a riot against Chinese was depicting a riot in Denver in the 1880s. In California, the anti-Chinese Workingmen's Party with its key slogan, the Chinese must go, became a major political force. Perhaps the most horrific massacre was at Rock Springs, Wyoming in 1885. Irish American miners march on the Chinese community, driving out the entire population and killing 55, said to be the worst race riot in US history. They showed up, they set fire to the entire Chinese neighborhood, and then uh, beat or murdered those who were fleeing. And it was not an isolated attack. In the 1880s, white workers in at least 168 towns forced Chinese residents to leave. In addition to that sort of truly widespread violence, workers fought hard for legislation to eliminate Chinese laborers, lobbying Congress, and they had their great victory in 1882 when the Chinese Exclusion Act barred Chinese laborers, only laborers, again, think about the, the class issue here. Merchants, missionaries could still come, but not workers. It barred the, for the, them for, from entering the U.S. for 10 years. It's a hugely important moment in U.S. history as the first time that a specific ethnic or racial group was excluded from the U.S. The cartoon you see at the bottom shows um, Chinese looking at what's happening in Rock Springs, Wyoming 
and saying, um, here's a pretty mess. And isn't it wonderful that the people in the US are the enlightened ones? This Chinese Exclusion Act and the mobilizations that then followed it arguably is the, constitutes the most important political achievement of the US working class during the entire 19th century. The repercussions of this were huge and lasted more than a century. Why was it so important? In part because the way labor activists fought to make it permanent and then began using it as a model to exclude other groups. After winning this first tenure ban on Chinese laborers, activists focused politically on extending the ban. Samuel Gompers was personally involved along with other AFL leaders. Here's an image from the AFL pamphlet which became quite popular. Meat versus rice, American manhood against Asian coolism. So again, this notion of we are the free labor, we are opposed to coolism or slave labor. Some of what's inside that pamphlet includes comments like this. Whatever business or trade they enter is doomed for the white laborer, as competition is simply impossible. Or this, advancement with an incubus like the Chinese is like the growth of a child with a malignant tumor upon his back. At the time of manhood, death comes of the malignity. In 1892, the AFL succeeded in extending exclusion 10 more years, and then it kept fighting. And in 1902, it became a permanent law. It would remain the law of the land until 1943, astonishingly. This mobilization, the, the success with the Chinese exclusion, became the model for the labor movement. Labor activists began building on this strategy used to ban Chinese workers and work to restrict other kinds of immigration as well. As the US began to acquire colonies around the world in the late 19th century, Gompers worried particularly about the impact on immigration, saying we shall be compelled to open the gates and admit the Chinese, Malays, and slave laborers who may come from our new possessions. This uh, classic cartoon is not, of course, a labor cartoon, but I think it kind of shows some of the attitudes that labor activists shared in. This notion that a savage people could not be taught. You see people from the colonies in the front row, they have to sit close to the teacher because they're the, you know, the problematic ones. You can see in the back the white children who were uh, disciplined, studiously reading their books. Really an interesting, my students always can spend a whole class time just analyzing this image. You see Native Americans towards the, towards the back, one uh, perhaps waiting to be allowed into the room, and an African-American student up in the top left doing cleaning, not even in the discussion to be let into the schoolroom as a student. In the next years, labor activists became leaders in the effort uh, to end Southern and Eastern European immigration as well. As you know, from the 1880s, 1890s onward, we still have many immigrants entering the US from Germany, from Britain, uh, from Northern and Western Europe. But by this time, the, the numbers are being overwhelmed by people from Southern and Eastern Europe, Italians, Eastern European Jews, and, and those groups again, as the Chinese had earlier, seem like a problem. They're cheap 
labor, they compete with native-born white male workers for jobs. So the labor movement begins to focus great effort on now excluding them following the process that had been laid out with the Chinese Exclusion Act. Terence Powderly, who had been head of the Knights of Labor, becomes commissioner of immigration and works hard for restrictions. These efforts finally bear fruit with the infamous Johnson-Reed Act of 1924 in which carefully articulated racial quotas especially limit immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe and add a sweeping ban on all Asian migration, whether workers or merchants or missionaries, whatever. Anyone in that act, anyone deemed ineligible for citizenship is banned from entering the country. And since that Naturalization Act of 1790 had specified that only white persons could come in, um, many Asians, Arabs, are permanently considered ineligible for citizenship. This cartoon, again, kind of gives a sense of, of some of the, the anti-immigrant discourse of the day and this sense, you know, using these images like hordes of people flooding into the United States. Of course, around the same time, the AFL is also neglecting African-American and female workers as well. Uh, so in addition to labor's war against immigrants, the AFL is uh, focused on doing what it can to represent and support predominantly white male native-born workers. Many unions in this period have clauses in their constitution which excludes African-Americans. Uh, women and immigrants, people of Asian or Latino descent are rarely organized by the AFL. The AFL justifies its lack of interest in organizing them by saying they're, they're really not disciplined enough for union membership. And so it's left to other groups to do that organizing. Let me end by talking about kind of a, a final example of a rare successful campaign for labor rights at the state level, anyway. The most progressive labor legislation of the entire period, 1880 to 1920, came at the state level in New York. And it resulted from uh, kind of a really a rare combination of labor organizing and a tragedy. The labor organizing was the uprising of the 20,000, as scholars call it, in 1909, when really taking the lead, young, radical Jewish and Italian women went out on strike in the garment industry, forcing the male leadership of their union, the International Ladies Garment Worker Union, to come along and join them in the strike. But it was really these young women, ages usually typically 16 to 22 years old, who pushed for a strike. The strike lasted for months, and it resulted in some gains, but it didn't result in union recognition. And so in many of the smaller factories, in particular, conditions remained terribly exploitative. Doors were nailed shut so that people, <coughs> workers couldn't shoplift. They were denied breaks for meals or for going to the bathroom. They couldn't speak to one another. Just horrible conditions. And then in 1911 came the tragedy, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire that killed 146 young Jewish and Italian women. After that tragedy, the same coalition that had worked during the uprising of the 20,000 came back together. But it was, not a, it was not a coalition dominated by the official labor movement. The official labor movement pretty much stayed apart, saying again, these are workers who aren't disciplined enough for us to organize them. 
So instead, a coalition of the Women's Trade Union League, which was a cross-class alliance of middle class, upper class, and working class women, came together with socialists, with journalists, and with the union, the ILGWU. They demanded change. And in response, the state of New York created a factory commission to investigate conditions and ultimately succeeded in passing dozens of laws, especially focused on solving problems that created that fire at Triangle. No more doors locked shut, things like that. But extensive laws beyond that, uh, stipulating hours of work in a day, things like that, that became altogether the most advanced, the most progressive code of labor laws in the United States, and ultimately, show, uh, ultimately proved to be kind of a dress rehearsal for the New Deal. 20 years later, uh, reformers would start by looking at that code of labor laws, using it as a model for change. So, just to wrap up, let's kind of take a step back and think about why, why am I talking about this kind of stuff? Why is this important? The labor rights achieved in New York, of course, were unique because of the scale of labor protests there, as well as the tragedy of the Triangle Fire. And yet, nonetheless, it's useful to consider if if the strategies I've explored here to exclude as much as possible workers deemed unworthy from the US, from, the, from jobs or from unions, what might have happened had broader solidarities and more of a sense of inclusiveness shaped the labor movement? What might have happened? These exclusions at the turn of the 20th century cast a very long shadow. It would be very hard for the labor movement to recover, to build broad solidarities, to embrace anyone who works for a living. Uh, down through the decades, these kinds of tensions would continue and would shape and limit the labor movement in its fight for rights in the United States. Just as an example, only as recently as 1989 did the AFL-CIO change its position and come out as supporting equitable treatment for all immigrants within the United States. So when we look to labor struggling to win rights today, and when we think about that there's still a long way to go in the United States, workers still often lack the right to a union or face discrimination, shops are shut down when they try to unionize or they face being fired. It's, it's always an important issue to look at. Is there a clear strategy among the labor unions to build that inclusiveness and those broad solidarities? Because in the end, the success at winning labor rights depends very much on that. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Last time Julie was here, we went out into the Badlands and there was a terrible uh, rain and muck and it was like a point-to-point -point hike to the petrified forest. And I believe we left several of our scholars behind. We buried them there, but, but you, you toughed it out. And so I was really sorry to hear that you're leaving tomorrow morning to avoid a repeat of that ordeal. So. Yeah, exactly. So there's the right stuff. All right. Well, thank you. So uh, I'm going to, of course, ask you to situate Theodore Roosevelt in this discussion here in a minute. But if you look at this great, sad, troubling cartoon, uh, you say your students can spend a lot of time deconstructing it. So I have a question. The Native American is reading, so studying, presumably, but not quite in the mix, off to the side, right? and wearing traditional headdress and regalia and a blanket. How do we read that? It is interesting. Uh, is this on? No. 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 
has to look green. There yeah, go. there we go. There, it's green. green. For green. Yeah. yeah, green for green. A little higher on your, on your lapel. Oh, okay. Thanks. I always need tips like that. Sorry. How's that? Better. Better. Speak loud. Thank you, yeah. Um, yeah, well, it's very interesting in terms of the, you know, the issue of boarding schools and all of that. This is not that. This is a, a traditional Native American. But he's also holding the book upside down. It's Cuba uh, written on it, but upside down. And clearly placed apart, right? Like he's not, he's not wanted in the room as a student. And actually, I think I misspoke. The, the, it's very interesting, the little boy standing outside, not even allowed in the room, looks to be Chinese. Chinese yes. So again, that reflects the history of the Chinese Exclusion Act. What's the date of this cartoon? I think it's 18, uh, it's after 1898, so probably like 1902. So if you think of the Native American there, but book upside down, so clearly not ready uh, to read in the English language. Uh, I mean, the, what this says to, to me, Julie, is that We'll make a good effort. We'll make a good effort to provide some education, a simulative education for natives, but don't don't count on success. Mm -hmm. Is that what, how you read this? You could read it that way. You could also read it as it's not worth trying. Right. They're a lost cause. And they're and they're not going to be in in the center of the room, are they? Right. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's a, and then of course the African American student or servant, whatever it is. Yeah, and you can't, you can't read the text on this. The resolution isn't good enough. But on the blackboard, uh, if you Google it at home later, it, it's, it talks about how um, generous spirited is the American empire. So we're so fortunate to have these cartoons from Puck and Judge. And as a historian, when you find something like this, you must really revel in it because they reveal so much about the culture of the time in some ways more explicitly than what is written. Absolutely, absolutely. Cartoons like this are, they shape what I write and how I write it, but they're especially great as a teaching tool because they just really draw students into the, the moment. Do we know what Uncle Sam's book and the, and the poster or the piece of paper underneath are saying? No, I don't. Be interesting. The, the book says US on it, so right. I, think, I think it might be like an encyclopedia guide to America's new possessions. Um, because another thing that was happening at this, in these years is, America is American citizens are very interested in the new empire and books that talk about what it's like in the Philippines or Guam or Hawaii or the Isthmus of Panama are becoming big sellers. And then there's a globe uh, down in the lower left, so America's new global position is being signified here. Right, right. And there's all kind of, kind of rethinking the spatial relations of the United States in this period as well. The American Historical Association hosts an entire conference on rethinking America now that it is a Pacific power as well as an Atlantic power. It's as if the world has become smaller thanks to our new empire. I can see this cartoon as like the final exam in a, a course on this era. So explicate this cartoon. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's go to the next one, Chris. <laughs> No, the, the next cartoon, I'm sorry. There. All right, so <laughs> let's just study this for a moment. Who's trying to get in? Yeah, it's clearly depicting people from different countries. I, I absolutely see Southern Europeans, Italians. But some of the people, you can just barely see on their hat, it says why they're not wanted, illiterate radical, things like that. So this is um, very much a cartoon focused on the growing movement to restrict European immigration. What's the date? Can you tell us? I'm not sure. 
I'm guessing 1908, 18, maybe. Late 1890s, 1905, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, and you see the, the, the Uncle Sam pointing, embracing the flag and the laurels of liberty um, and, the, and the, the tidal wave of this starting to engulf him and then danger to American ideas and institutions. Not to get political, but this could have been published last month. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. Riff-raff immigration, right? So there's this increasing call, the problematizing the Italian and the Eastern European Jew as a threat to American democracy, to American institutions. So Uncle Sam is not only hugging the flag, but the, it has written on the flag liberty. So they are a danger to all of that. You know, the Italians um, face violence, not, not on the scale that the Chinese faced a few decades earlier, but pretty intense. You know, so there's a mass lynching of Italians in New Orleans in 1892, considered to be one of the uh, largest mass lynchings of anyone in American history. Um, often there are lynchings of them or beatings of them, attempted lynchings. I have a great graduate student who's actually studying violence towards Italian immigrants in this period, and it's widespread. Sometimes it's linked to labor struggles. Sometimes it's linked to worries that they're uh, connected to the mafia, a uh, very you know, common xenophobic charge towards Italians, of course. Often, as with African Americans, it's linked to um, alleging that they had in engaged in sexual crimes. Um, so, and then of course there's, you know, anti-Semitism towards Jewish immigrants is off the chart as well. Um, so eugenics is also spreading in this period and new understandings of sort of racial and ethnic hierarchies which uh, project Italians and Jews both as at the lower end of human evolution. And all of this helps to kind of justify this wave of anti-immigrant restrictions. So Julie, if this cartoon were published now, there would be enormous blowback. Um, speaking of riffraff immigration, the racial stereotyping and caricaturing of um, aspirants, um, the, the, the sense of paranoia, the America firstism, how much pushback or blowback or counter narrative was going on in this time to say, hey, wait a minute, this is is this, is this what the ideals of America represent? Was, was this more, more normal, more normative in the time? I'm sorry to say yes. Yeah, I, I'm really, really interested in the pro-immigrant voices in this period, and there are some. Um, you know, you, you do see radical labor organizations like the industrial workers of the world that are open to anybody and that really embrace the struggles of immigrant workers. You see some unions, which again will help to create the breakthroughs in labor organizing that occurred during the New Deal, like the International Ladies Garment Workers Union. And you see a few reformers. There's uh, somebody like Isaac Howerwich, who is a Jewish man, who really tried to you know, almost as a sole man against the wave of anti-immigrant sentiment, tried to stand up and, and talk about the good that immigrants do for the United States. But his was a, his was a rare voice. Minority voice. So Chris, could you just toggle back slowly till we get to the one where you say the achievement of workers in the 19th century, the Chinese exclusion. It's about six back, I think. The other back? Back. Oh, yeah, the other way. It, sorry. There, there you go. There, wait, right there. Yep. All right, so it's, what an interesting sentence for you to put in this PowerPoint. This was arguably the most important political achievement. Sounds like something really good is to follow, right? This was arguably the most important political achievement of the U.S. during working class during the entire 19th century. So unpack that a little bit because. This is a time when workers are asserting their rights. Their principal concern is, is job security and wages and working conditions. They're antagonistic to the flood of cheap labor from elsewhere. Um, 
irrespective of the, the racial and ethnic elements of it, just the protection of, of their own labor and their um, wages. You're saying this is an achievement, and they saw it as an achievement, but of course when we look back on it, we see it as bigotry and discrimination and so on. So can you unpack that? Yeah, I'm glad you highlighted that, uh, Clay, because to me that, that was kind of the starting point of this talk. I, as a, you know, I've been doing this labor history thing now for a long time, and I've learned about, for years, about the Chinese Exclusion and Act and the anti-Chinese movement, but I would learn about it and say, okay, well, that was horrible, but now let's talk about all the other things workers were doing and all the good things and what they wanted to achieve, and so that was just this kind of horrible thing we bracket and set aside. And I thought, really, when you think about how that became a model, how it led to excluding Chinese until 1943, for heaven's sake, and even after that, I mean, the quota for Chinese to enter the country even after 1943 was 100 people a year. 100 human beings per annum. Yeah, until the 1960s when immigration policy has changed. I mean, to, uh, to us today, that's almost unthinkable that, that for all those decades, Chinese workers, Chinese people couldn't enter the United States. So I just thought, um, and, and, and then the, if you add that it, that became the model for restricting, for ending Italian and Eastern European Jewish immigration in 1924, for decades until the 60s. That's such a hugely important thing. So I thought, what does it do to how we understand the 19th century if we see it as the most impactful achievement of the white working class? And so what do you make of it? Because it's an achievement, to be sure, from their perspective, but it's not necessarily an achievement that's in the best interests of a country who's dedicated to certain principles of liberty and so on. Absolutely, not in the interests of the country according to the, any values uh, that, that most Americans would hold true, but nor was it in the interest of the United States. But you know, in a way it encapsulates the, the drama of this country's history, right? From the founders of the country writing the Declaration of Independence when they owned slaves, right? This, this, we want democracy, liberty, but we're going to bracket out certain people as not deserving. And so in a way, this whole, the story I've told today is a, a story of that bracketing. If you don't, if you're not a moral producer, if you're not a good person, then you're not, you're not part of the country we want. We're going to set you aside. I know the audience wants to ask questions, but, uh, but I should, I think in the name of our enterprise here, ask you to say something about Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> yeah, I figure that's the law, right? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, this is my story today is a bottom-up story. My first book dealt a lot with um, the labor movement's efforts to pass uh, political reforms, and to do that, they tried to elect what they called reward our friends and punish our enemies, and. And you know, Roosevelt had an interesting history on labor. When he was in New York State, he pushed for reforms as president. He, he pushed for mediation in the 1902 anthracite strike. So he certainly had some cred to stand upon. But generally speaking, overall, the labor movement saw him as an enemy, not a friend. Even after the anthracite incident? Yeah. I mean, they were, they were happy about that, but they, you know, I think they were suspicious of his showmanship, that he was, he was a performer, and he performed in the case of the anthracite strike, and he knew that it would look good and win him some friends, some credibility. But most of the time, he, he looked down on workers. He, 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 he agreed with those who saw even the AFL, which was quite a conservative labor organization, he agreed with those who saw them as troublemakers to be avoided at all costs. I just want to you know, potentially just push back for a second on this, Julie. In the anthracite strike, uh, he, he realized that the country depended upon coal, that it was our carbon, and winter was coming, 
calls in uh, the, the owner operators, does a little bully pulpit work with them, um, but then he says, if you won't cooperate, I'm going to nationalize the industry because we have to have coal. And because of his intervention, the operators backed down to a certain degree, and the laborers didn't get all that they wanted, but they got something. Yeah. So, I mean, that sounds to me like he's the first president to do that, to enter the arena on behalf of the laborers rather than just decide, as always, with big business. That seems like a big achievement, doesn't it? Why wouldn't that yeah. be taken really seriously by labor? It is. It was striking, no pun intended, that he would do that, especially when you, you know, compare it to what was happening just a little bit before, when in the Pullman boycott, the federal troops are pulled out, Homestead, you know, so many presidents. When they get involved, labor is hurt. So I'm just saying that I agree. It was a big, big moment. But did Gompers care? Did Gompers say maybe Roosevelt's the guy we should support? No, he didn't. He was ready to break with the Republicans and try to see a Democrat elected. Michael. Hey, thanks, Julie. That was fantastic. And I have a question that has nothing to do with history. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you to speculate. Um, but. We're 100 years out, nearly, from the uh, Reed Johnson Act and the quota system, which defined immigration for a century. And it seems to me, and you can correct me if you think I'm wrong, but that we are in a different time for immigration and labor. Uh, there are labor shortages around the world. Competition for labor seems to be increasing. How does the United States deal with a different context where there will be global comp competition for labor in the coming years? Can it afford to have the same policies of the 20th century in the 21st century? Oh, Michael. <laughs> I'm a historian. I know more about 1908 than 2008. Um, well, I think, you know, I think to, to get my head around that great question, I think it's a question that's as much about global capitalism as it is about labor and immigration policies. And for workers to win their rights, the job is much harder now because of the globalization of capitalism and because the, the, the ability, as a result of technological changes, capital moves in seconds, right? Uh, you, you click a computer button and capital is moving to a different part of the world where workers can be paid more cheaply. And then to tackle that, to tackle that the clothes we buy at Target or, or Walmart are made for pennies in, in Thailand or Indonesia, we have to tackle the whole supply chain, right? Because the Macy's doesn't says, well, we're not responsible. We contract that out to somebody else. So it's extremely difficult to do that kind of organizing. Um, and, and so winning labor rights is it's a problem in the US. We ha workers have way fewer rights in the United States than in any other part of the industrialized world, any other part of the global north. So winning more basic fundamental human rights is an issue here in the US, but it's also a global issue all over the place. And so we need to be thinking about that, need to be thinking about global capitalism and supply chains when we think about immigration policies. But you know, I, I just want to reinforce what, what Michael Cullinane is saying, that you've shown this pattern that goes back to 1790, that there's always been an edginess <laughs> Uh, in the establishment and the government of the United States about bringing in people that are considered to be marginal or undesirable in one way or another, um, the Alien and Sedition Laws of 1798, for example. That's a long and deep tradition in American life, and you hear some echoes of it not so long ago. If suddenly we are labor short and we are desperate for laborers, there's going to be a a budding up of these two traditions, right? One is a, pra a practical tradition, we need more workers, and the other one is this long and deeply rooted American tradition of xenophobia and self-protection. So surely that, that debate is coming, and sooner than we think. 
I think we're having that debate every day of our lives. I think this country is founded on that tension and that debate. In like 1901, planters in Hawaii wanted to bring in Filipino workers to, because the Japanese were organizing and demanding too much pay. And, and one of the planters said, we're looking, we want workers who will be servile and do what we say. And Taft said something like, how are you going to find workers that are completely servile, but also will be the foundation of building up a good society? Taft said this. How do you find people who do both? And that basic tension has shaped this country and still is today. Other questions? Yes, uh, President Easton. And I, I apologize if you've already answered this question up. Um, Chinese Exclusion Act and Rock Springs Massacre. Um, yes, there was, race was a major component of that issue, but the real issue, the fundamental issue was the Chinese were able to, were willing to work for lower rates of pay than the uh, miners who were descendants of Europeans. Uh, and so isn't, and isn't that, uh, so, so if, if, if labor could exclude, if the labor in Rock Springs, Wyoming could exclude the Chinese as an option, and it wasn't that the Union Pacific, uh, which was hiring the Chinese laborers, was some sort of, you know, wonderful company, it, they just had a cheaper labor alternative. So isn't that what it always is? Uh, uh, about is this group of people willing to work under conditions or for pay less than we believe they should work for? So how do we sort this out between the economic argument and then the eth ethnic and racial argument? Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to pose the question. I, I think um, what's clear to me is that they are so intertwined as to be inseparable. You know, it absolutely, I mean, workers, I'm sure, justified this utterly horrific level of violence by saying, well, they're competing for our jobs, they're working cheap. But, but what I see is that it was a racial issue, that, uh, that workers, uh, European, European immigrants face violence, <clears throat> but not at that level that Chinese did, nothing close to it. So there is, there is <clears throat> without the, the notion that these are slave workers, these are cheap men, we wouldn't have had the level of violence. So in a way, that is an economic issue, like you're saying. But race is also very much what it was about. Other questions? Am I missing? I want to make sure. I, I, yes, there's one right here. Um, Myron Just, so come on down. Just hang on, because she'll be right. She'll be right there with you with the microphone. We're streaming, so we need you to. Uh, he's right in the middle, second row. There you are. Sorry. Um, you know the immigration uh, reform keeps coming up again and again in, in the Congress, and we don't seem to be able to address it. Um, and we're building a wall as we speak, I guess, on the southern border. Um, so what do you see? I, you know, you referenced the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, and yet it was Chinese labor that built the Transcontinental Railroad, at least from the west uh, okay. moving, and Irish labor, I guess, a great extent from the east. So. Uh, how do, how do you see us in the 21st century coming to grips in a better way um, in this global world of today? This is where you say I'm a historian. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. go ahead and, and, yeah. and, and figure it out. Yeah, thank you for your question, which the best minds of the world haven't been able to solve. <laughs> um, you know, on a certain level, I believe that people should be able to move across borders as easily as capital does, to be totally honest. But that's not a pragmatic uh, 
solution to the problem. I know that's a highly utopian way to think about it. Um, but I do think that, that we need policies that would much more closely match what we need in this country. Um, and I think, you know, kind of like the president's question a minute ago, how, how to think about this and realize that the economic issue is very much intertwined with the racial issue, right? And we need to think more carefully about that and, and realize the ways in which our policies historically have penalized a country that we have a special relationship with, Mexico, and to some degree Central America as well. Um, and to realize that if we need that labor that we need to have less, less punishment, less people living in shadows, scared that they're going to be deported. Those kinds of fears, I think, don't help employers and they don't help the workers either. They don't, ultimately, they don't help American consumers either. So I want to ask, oh wait, here's a question here. And are we all right, Chris? We have another 10 minutes? All right. Yeah, just kind of switching from the immigration issue because that's certainly a hot button. Um, look into the, the adversarial relationship between labor and management that existed even way back, you know, as you rightfully uh, spoke about. And it doesn't seem to have evolved much when you look at today with, you know, the UAW and what's going on in the automotive. Yet you go across the pond and you look at Germany which has evolved and there is not a, you know, there's some adversary, but it's not like in the United States. Labor and management have evolved to a more working relationship. Why do you think that is? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I think that um, in the United States, the um, employer's side has been much more powerful than in Europe and much more able to set the sort of the rules of the game as to how easy or difficult it is to organize a union, what, what rights workers have on the workplace floor. You know, I fundamentally believe that if you don't, that, that we should have a constitutional right to join an organization that represents us. We should have a fundamental right to strike. So many workers don't have that right. Railroad workers recently had their strike ended by the president uh, on the grounds that it would be too damaging to the economy. If you don't have the right to withhold your labor, you, you're a coerced worker. You are, in effect, a slave, right? In Europe, there are many more protections that allow workers the freedom to, to say what they think when they're on the job. They have freedom of speech on the job, freedom of assembly. In the United States, if you're at Starbucks and you're trying to organize a union, you're likely to get your butt fired, right? So, um, so some of the tension, the clashing here comes in our current moment comes from the fact that workers are feeling for a variety of reasons, some of it was brought about by changes around the pandemic, workers are, are feeling frustrated and feeling like they want those basic rights and they're standing up to achieve them in a way we haven't seen in this country for a long time. Is there another question here? There's one right here and then I've got two and we'll close. Hey. Uh... Do you think the lack of racial solidarity uh, for, on the part of the union uh, contributed to the failure of the United States to create a successful labor party? Absolutely, yes, yeah. I mean, again, you know, if you compare the US in the period I've been looking at today to say the uh, British, uh, in, the, in the British case, the Labour Party in part came about because skilled workers in Britain allied with unskilled workers in a way they did not in the US. And of course in the US, those kind of broad solidarities were also harder to achieve because of our ethnic and racial diversity. Uh, so it was, there was not only the issue of skill and who was deemed worthy of being in a union, but then ethnic and racial tensions. Uh, connected to. So I think absolutely that 
um, so much of US history, the limitations of the New Deal, the lack of a Labor Party, are to some degree attributable to those issues. So uh, I just want to ask you two quick questions. There, and I don't think I'm projecting you into the future on this. Um, I'm, I want you to say something about the present moment. So everywhere I go, all across the country, there are signs up saying um, workers needed, uh, we're short staffed, uh, we're, we can't hire, there won't be any room service in your hotel because we can't, and so on. And I want you to help us understand that it, and it seems to me maybe we're having a kind of tacit workers strike across the nation that people mm -hmm. after the pandemic looked at what they used to be doing at McDonald's or at Walmart or whatever and said, Nuts to that, I'm not going back, I'm, I deserve more, and I'm not, I'm not going to sell my labor that inexpensively any longer. And they're holding out, even though we have very low unemployment, they're holding out for a, a major jump in the way that we compensate workers in America. Do you think that's true? Absolutely, and I think there's good reason why we're seeing it. You know, we, when you look at minimum wage in this country, if it had gone up at a level with the cost of living and inflation, the minimum wage now, I think the experts say, would be about $35, $40 an hour. If you look at how much um, CEO pay is compared to worker pay, I think in like 1965, CEOs paid 100 times what their workers make, now they make like a billion times what their workers make. So the, the inequality has sharply, if you look at any charts, particularly since the, the acute crisis in 2008, in, inequality has really gone off the charts in this country. And it, it's because there aren't very good labor protections, it's taken a while for working class people to respond with their feet, with striking or with refusing to take jobs that pay little. But now they're finally ready to do that. So last question, and there's, you know, there's a sort of a liberal bias to much of what we're saying here, and I want to just be the devil's advocate from the opposite end for a moment. Doesn't a country have a right to decide who's in and who's out? Um, many countries around the world have very, very restrictive immigration. They try to protect. Uh, social and racial homogeneity, economic ho homogeneity, cultural homogeneity. Um, most countries have much more restrictive immigration policies than the United States has in its de facto and slovenly way. Mm -hmm. That's okay under natural law, isn't it? I mean, you get to decide that who, who's in. And Britain left the European Union in large part because it wants to be able to control who comes in and under what circumstances. You know, that tends to be dismissed as bigotry and racist and so on, but isn't there an argument to be made that nations do have this right and it's an important debate and it should not just be assumed that there's a, an enlightened answer to this? I do agree that nations have that right. I also think nations have the right to decide how easily capital flows out of the country, but we don't, and we don't talk nearly enough about that side of it. Um, absolutely nations have that right and need to, need to think carefully about that. Um, but at the same time, thinking about it in terms of the history of it and thinking about who benefits and who doesn't from immigration policies, I think is super important. But you will acknowledge, I think, that the United States has historically the most welcoming immigration policy of most countries, possible exception Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But, and you know, as we've been kind of exploring this morning, that has come with a tradition at the same time of tensions and, and xenophobia as well. But yeah, I mean, not only welcoming immigrants, but birthright citizenship was a hugely important and radical thing that the US did um, in the 19th century. To think that the children of people who were ineligible for citizenship because of the Naturalization Act of 1790, their children can become citizens. That changed the course of this country forever. Julie Green, thank you so much. Thank you. There's still time to change your flight. <laughs> I'll work on it. Chris.